Book of Matthew, chapter 10. I tried to switch off this week and try to find something a little bit different than I've been on lately, but I, I think I haven't got it out of my system yet. <clears throat> this idea that the world, and when I say the world, I, I'm talking about the creatures in this world, have continued to portray Jesus in just one aspect of his personality. And it just, it drives me nuts, really, on a personal level, on a preacher level, and everything else. Every one of us, uh, and I, I don't mean multiple personalities that we have. Some of us have multiple personalities. But within each of us, we have a range of degrees of personality. Sometimes we're moody. Sometimes we're happy. Sometimes we're morose. Sometimes we're angry and PO'd and just the whole limit. That's what makes us what we are. Now, there's certain aspects of my personality, for instance, that you might not like, period, ever. And maybe those aspects of my personality are what seem to come out the most. There's other aspects of my personality that you might like or enjoy, and maybe those don't come out that much. So if you're keeping score, you say, well, I don't really feel like being around that guy that much. I don't like this or I don't like that. Or sometimes he slips into this mode or he slips into that mode. We're all like that. We all have a virtually a 360 degree personality. And it's not right that somebody just picks on one little aspect of that totality and seem or try to make that the person. Jesus had a whole range of personality traits that he displayed in his life. And yet, in this modern culture, we gravitate on just one or two aspects of that. We want to portray him as some sniveling little milk toast that loves everybody that puts up with everything, doesn't want to offend a single solitary soul, will bend over backwards to let you have your way to accommodate you in whatever lifestyle or whatever manifestation of a life that you want to express. That's the Jesus that we see today, portrayed. Couldn't be any further from the truth. And yet, you don't see it today. Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 12. Matthew 10, verse 12. He's giving his disciples some instructions as to how they should <laughs> conduct themselves when they're on the road ministering and preaching. Obviously, in, the, in this day, in this culture, they didn't have Motel 6s. They didn't have Sheratons or MC Suites or any of that stuff. So if you were traveling, for the most part, you would stay at somebody's house. They would give you a little basin of water to wash your feet in. That was the customary nice thing to do. They would give you food. They would give you stuff to drink. They would give you a place to sleep. And you would go on your way. And it wasn't a big deal because that's the way everybody did it. That was the culture of the day. So he's giving his disciples some instructions as to how they should conduct themselves during these outings. So beginning at verse 12. And when you come into a house, salute it. You know, hey, how you doing? I appreciate you inviting me in. So salute it. You know, be cordial, be nice. And of the house be worthy, because you don't know when you're coming up to this place what type of people they are, what their political stance might be, what their spiritual level might be. You don't know. So he says, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. 
But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. So in other words, right off the bat, we, we see a somewhat of a confrontational aspect here. If the people are nice, if they're cordial, if they're inviting you in, if they're just nice, sweet people, okay, return it in kind. But if they're not, if they've got a, a bug someplace, you respond accordingly. Verse 14. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Wow. That's not saying, hey, thanks for the uh, hospitality. Thanks for being cordial, because obviously these particular ones weren't. He says, if they don't receive you, if they don't receive your words, if you try to tell them about me, and they say, fooey on you, we don't want to hear it. We believe in Caesar, or we believe in this. Hey, just walk out of there, shake the dust off your feet. Don't worry about it. You don't have to bend over and kowtow and kiss their you-know-whats just to be politically correct. Shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now see, here's an aspect of his personality that you don't really see in the, expressed in the Christian world. He is making a, a vast distinction here. He's saying there are some nice people there are some people who will accommodate you. There are some people who will listen to you. There are some people who will ultimately agree with you. But he's also acknowledging the fact that there are certain people out there that will not acknowledge it, that will not go along with you, that will not listen to you. Of those, he says, shake the dust of your feet. Fooly on them. Let them go. It's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that group. So you can see already in his mind, he's, he's got a division going on in here. Not everybody is painted with the same brush. Not everybody is afforded the same results. You don't get participation awards in real life. The winners get the, the ribbons or the trophies or the medals. The losers don't until we get to this stage of our culture. And everybody gets handed a participation trophy. Matthew chapter 11. All these are going to be in Matthew, and they're all relatively in the same lump here. Beginning in verse 16. Matthew 11, beginning at verse 16. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? Already, you can see there's a distinction in his head. What am I going to compare you guys with? It is like little children sitting in the markets and calling <clears throat> under their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. And we have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. I, I can just see dripping through these words this modern culture that we live in today. Everybody's supposed to love everybody. Everybody's supposed to get along with everybody. Everybody's supposed to tolerate everybody. Verse 18. For John came neither, this is John the Baptist, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath a devil. All right, well, okay. Verse 19, the Son of Man, that's me, Jesus, he's saying, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, 
And they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. In other words, he's saying, I can't win for losing. You guys want it both ways. John comes, he's not eating and drinking, and you say he's got a devil. I come eating and drinking, and you're saying I'm stupid here. So which way do you want it? In other words, there's certain people you'll never please. There's certain people who it doesn't matter what you say, what political stance you take, what religious stance you take, what moral stance you take. They're never going to agree. Some people just love to disagree for the sake of disagreeing. They get off on it. They're hardwired like that. And Jesus is pointing this out. I find it interesting that Jesus was accused of gluttony and wine-bibbing. That's another term for drinking too much. Some say he never drank. Well, somebody obviously thought he was drinking. He didn't deny that he drank. But the point he's trying to make is you can't have it both ways. You can't have a God that says turn the other cheek exclusively and then have a, the same God saying it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Which way do you want it? you got to take them both. But the modern Christian world does not want to take them both. They don't want that mean, nasty, Old Testament type expression of God being God. They want to neuter him. They want to control him. They want to make him a buddy. They want to make him a pal. They want to make him a partner. Well, we're all going to get rich together, God. Here's my ten bucks. Where's my thousand bucks? Verse 20. Then he began to upbraid the cities. That's chew them out. Get mad at them. Upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. I mean, these guys saw the loaves and the fishes. They saw him walk on water. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him cast out demons. They saw him heal the sick. They saw him restore withered arms and legs and so forth. They saw him restore sight to the blind. They saw him heal leprosy. They saw all these things, and yet they repented not. Wow, you talk about hard core. This is amazing. So he says in verse 21, Woe unto thee! Chorazin, woe unto be Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. So again, there's another distinction here that he's trying to put out. Everybody is not equal. Somebody is going to get more judgment. Somebody is going to get hit harder in the second coming than others. And, and we've so neutered this concept. We, we just don't see it. It's just gone from us. Verse 23, And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted under heaven. He used to live there. He had a house there. Capernaum, exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. Man, you talk about distinctions. You talk about one side of the hand and the other side of the hand. Brought down to hell, for if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable. Another distinction here? Yeah, it's going to be more tolerable for 
the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Turn to another one. Matthew 15. You know, I think, and I, I'm talking right now about Christians, born again, on their way to heaven, sealed under the day of redemption, eternally secure, names written in the Lamb's book of life. These people are going to go to heaven. And yet, the shock that they're going to receive when they stand before the Lord 15 seconds after that rapture takes place. It is going to be unbelievable. There's a verse in Revelation that states that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is talking about somebody in heaven. Well, I thought heaven was a place of glorious peace and tranquility and wonderfulness and greatness and so forth. Tears? Tears in heaven? And so we'll say, well, yeah, th those are tears, you know, expressed because your loved ones didn't make it. And so naturally you're sorry. You know, maybe your mom or your dad didn't get saved or, or maybe one of your kids or some of your kids never got saved and they're not there with you in heaven. They had to go to hell. And so, yeah, there's tears. No, 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 no. The context of that is <clears throat> your conduct as a Christian between the time that you got saved and the time of the rapture or the time that you died, your conduct as a Christian, that's what's in play in that verse. So when it says that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, that means somebody is sad in heaven. Somebody got up there and got their butt kicked at the judgment seat of Christ. Somebody got up there and got a whoop upside the head, a wake-up call. That yes, it did matter what you believed down here. It did matter how you acted down here. It did matter what you did down here. Instead of just coasting through, resting on the fact, yeah, I'm saved. I can do anything I want. I don't have to worry about this. I don't have to worry about that. Well, you'll still get in. But you'll have lost every reward, everything that God had for you in the process. Matthew 15, beginning at verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord. So this lady is a Canaanite. She's not a Jew. Obviously, she's not a Christian. There wasn't any Christians as such yet at this point. But she's not a Jew. She's a Canaanite. If you remember anything about Old Testament, you realize that the arch enemy of God and the Jews in the Old Testament was the Canaanites. These are the ones that possessed the land of Israel before Moses and those guys that, you know, came in and God gave them the land. This is the bunch that God said, kill them. Kill them all. Kill the moms, the dads, the grandpas, the grandmas, the kids, the little sucklings, the little babies. Kill them all. There was no break for these guys. Now, obviously, they didn't kill them all. I mean, they lasted, you know, they're still here today. You've heard of the Gaza Strip. We don't hear too much about that anymore because ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all this other stuff have you know, gotten such uh, prominent press. But 15, 20, 25 years ago, uh, the biggest thing you heard you know, was the Palestinians and the Gaza Strip. Well, the Gaza Strip is that one little strip on the, the, the Mediterranean coast of Israel has primary, five primary cities in it. This is the exact same five primary cities that was in Israel's day 
this is the land of the Philistines. Still there. Goliath, Philistine. So this trouble that Israel's been having, it, it's gone on for millennium. Not just centuries, millennium. <coughs> and it's still here. But at any rate, in Jesus' day, he's out there with his disciples, having lunch or something. And some lady comes up to him. Ha happens to be a Canaanite. She approaches him. She says, have mercy on me, O Lord. What's wrong with that? She comes up to him. And by the fact that she comes up to him, she's acknowledging the fact that he is going to be able to help her. At least in her mind, she thinks so. Or she would have just ignored him and gone on to somebody else or just walked out and gone someplace different. But the fact that she approaches him shows that in her mind, he has the capacity and the power to help whatever need that she has. She further embellishes it by referring to him as Lord. She's not dissing him. She's not putting him down. She's not giving him his rightful due. She's doing everything proper. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. I mean, she's just, she's laying it on. She knows the right buzzwords. She knows the right protocol. And she's going through that checklist. She approaches him. She refers to him as Lord, son of David. And then her request. My, and it's not even for her. She didn't say, you know, give me a million bucks. Heal me from my bursitis or whatever I happen to have. She is asking for someone else. What can possibly go wrong here? My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Oh, I'm so sorry for you. Oh, you poor unfortunate woman. To be saddled with this in your family, oh man, I oh I oh I'm so sorry. Here, let me give you a hug. Let me pat you on the back. What's he do? She's approached him respectfully. She's acknowledged him as Lord. She acknowledges him as the son of David. She asks for somebody else. And what's his response? Verse 23. But he answered her, not a word. Ignored her. Totally dissed her. I can just, I can just in her place, I can feel that heat of embarrassment, of being singled out of being hung out to dry. Here she is in a public place. He's got his disciples with him. There's other people around. She approaches him. That probably took some guts. She exposes herself as someone in need. She humbles, humbles herself, <clears throat> makes a request, and he totally disregards her. Not a word. I can see the press now. I can see the field day they have with this, if they were there. Oh, the so-called alleged Jesus Christ of Nazareth, so-called alleged Lord of the universe and so forth, completely disrespects, completely disses, completely put down, shot down, irrespective of her feelings, made her feel bad. She probably cried. Wah, 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 wah. I can see the headlines now. This is supposed to be the caring, wonderful, supplicating, caressing, end-all, be-all guy. Look at him. He's so full of himself. He thinks so highly of himself. He didn't even deign to even respond to her. He completely ignored her. 
What a jerk. He answered her not a word. And the disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Now they're getting hammered here. Verse 24, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Wow. You talk about a put down. You talk about racial now. You talk about prejudicial now. You talk about name calling now. I mean, every single politically correct thing that we venerate and worship in this culture that we live in, he just completely stomped it right into the ground right there. In other words, I'm not sent to you. In other words, you're a Canaanite. In other words, you're a second-class citizen. In other words, you don't count. I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So if you're not a Jew, take a hike. Just fill in the blank today of our headlines. Oh, the gays are offended. The Islamics are offended. The jihadists are offended. The, uh, just don't get me going. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, fooling you. First he dissed her by not even responding to her. Then he tells her, hey, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You don't qualify. Talk about politically incorrect. No wonder I like this guy so much. Verse 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Wow, now she's really pulled out all the stops. And you see the difference? She didn't get offended. She didn't say, oh, you're calling me names. Oh, I'm going to take this to OSHA, or I'm going to take this to HR, or I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Nye, 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 nye. Wah, wah, wah. No, she, she got it. You're right, she's saying. You are only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I don't qualify. So instead of getting it all politically upheavaled here, she just pulls out all the stops. She doubles down. She falls down and she just worships him. Lord, help me. But he answered and said, he's not done yet. You'd think that would have cracked the veneer right there. He's not done yet. But he answered, but, uh, he answered and said, it is not meat, it is not proper for me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. He's already put the knife in. Now he is twisting it. I mean, she must feel two inches tall at this point. I mean, she's come to him. She's venerated him. She's acknowledged him. That didn't work. He dissed her, completely ignored her. Then she falls down and worships him. And then she gets nailed again. And she said, truth, Lord, you're right. I'm a dog. I don't deserve to eat at the table. Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. See, he's not all bad. When he initially dissed her, then subsequently when he doubled down and he made her feel that much worse, 
He had a reason for this. He had a purpose. It wasn't just to diss her for dissing's sake. He wanted to see how tight she was going to hold on, how far she was willing to go. Did she really mean it, or was she just, oh, here's some guy who can help me. I'm going to avail myself of this and just see what happens. No. He made her work for it. He made her work for it. And don't think that that wasn't lost on her. She understood completely what was going on here. And yet, if we played this scene out for CNN or Fox or whoever it is today, and they were like little flies on the wall watching this dialogue between the two, Jesus would have been crucified on the spot unfeeling, uncaring, aloof, proud, arrogant. And yet at the end of the day, he made his point. Matthew 23. Matthew 23, beginning at verse 13. These are one of my favorite ones. This is the running battle that he has with the Pharisees. The Pharisees, of course, are the religious leaders of the day. Um, and it, it's just a, a, a constant war he had with them. Now, remember, you've got people that say, well, you shouldn't call people names. We're not allowed to call people names today. In fact, there are certain words that we can't even say the word even in a descriptive manner. I'm surprised. I, I, I haven't checked lately. I'm not even sure if they're in the new dictionaries. The, the word is so sacred and holy that we cannot say. I don't, I don't know if the, the subsequent editions of dictionaries are even going to have the words in. We have to use the, the initial for the word. This is how politically correct we've been. And if somebody wants to describe that word, he's going to get nailed for describing the word. Not using the word in a bad way, but even in describing the word. That's how far we've gone into this land of idiocy in which we live. So we're not supposed to disparage people. We're not supposed to put people down. We're not supposed to point out differences. We're not supposed to do any of these things that are going to offend anybody, hurt anybody, make them feel second class. All this stuff. Well, here's the Lord of the universe. Here's your Lord and Savior. Here's Jesus Christ himself. Verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. <gasps> he called him a hypocrite. Do you realize how bad that must have made them feel? To be called a hypocrite publicly? Do you realize what that does to their reputation? I mean, they spent all they, they spent 30 years before they could even apply to be a Pharisee. They've had education of the yin-yang. They've done all the stuff that they can possibly do. They got to this honored position of being a Pharisee, a leader of the religious laws of the Jews. 